So I told our developers, get your shit together, stop building the exchange, build me the affiliate portal. We were the first one to come up with such a comprehensive affiliate portal. Now everyone has and everyone copied Bybit. Ben Zhao, co-founder and CEO of Bybit. The world's third largest crypto exchange by volume, with a daily trading volume estimated at more than 12 billion euros. Everyone in the team said, Ben, we need the second pair. We now need Ethereum. Copy BMAX to follow the second pair, the third pair. I'm like, guys, nobody gives a shit about if we have a second or a third, because nobody knows who the fuck you are. What I notice is a lot of people who are successful entrepreneurs or successful in crypto or both are gamers. What's more important to the kids is they actually find something they like to focus on. Focus is so crucial that you realize when you get in the world, most people cannot do that. What's your advice to the freshly grads who feel that they're working for a big company and it's not going fast enough? First, congratulations, you have that feel. I think that feeling is what drives everything. You told me you built your own school, non-profit. Profiting from education just doesn't go well with me. I did some research, there's no non-profit preschool in Singapore. So I was like, fuck it, let's just build one. What's the few key things that are completely different that you want to do in your preschool? So there was a few things I couldn't find. Number one is... Why would you tell your 21 years old impatient self if you met him today? By Bitcoin? <laughs> You're expecting some profound answers, right? <laughs>
right. their relationship with their parents. Mm. So let's go through that. You grew okay. up in China. Yeah. Um, I, I was in China until I was 11. So I think my family, it's, I'm from North, the North of China. And uh, my fam my parents are very liberal they are in, in the sense that they don't really give a shit about the result, the numbers, the academic. They're not the typical Chinese parents where they're very harsh on the uh, Is it on the something academic. from the North specific, or just from this specific family? I think it's more or less my family because my grandparents are both uh, extremely highly educated. My granddad was the, the guy who ran the, da the I'm from Dalian. Uh, Dali in the city, and um, the the city was actually occupied by Japan and Russia for some time because it was a very important military seaport. So our city has a lot of foreign influence, especially Japan and all that. So my granddad, when he was a kid, he used to work for a Japanese company and family. Uh, whereas um, the, the the city itself is very different than the other cities in China because. Dalian was traded as part of Manchuria for the for the Japan's uh, uh, occupation. So they treated Dalian as part of Japan. So you have families, women and Japanese kids living in the city. So they were never uh, brutal in any way. They were actually treating the Dalian city like how they treated the Taiwan. So if you go to Taiwan, they're very pro-Japan. They're very Japanese feel. It's completely different than like Nanking and all that. So in a way, my dad went to school. I mean, no, my, my grandparents was influenced quite a bit because they were working in Japan, uh, in the Japanese family and all that. And when he became an adult, he became the, the main chef editor and then eventually the kind of uh, the, the general manager of Dalian Daily that writes newspapers. So he's very good with his hand writings, these things, which is very rare for a grandparents uh, level mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Chinese family, right? And so my parents were also brought up very liberal in, in a way that they were not so much about academic, but eventually uh, my dad uh, was the first batch of people that started private like restaurants, private companies. Uh, he was the first one to um, actually became a, a agent to send students from China to overseas. Wow. So he was very big at that time because he was the first one to do it. He was sending kids to New Zealand, Ireland, the U.S., Canada. As a business. As a business in mm. the 1990s, 91, right? Right. Very early stage. So he was very much exposed right, by the global influence because he was traveling everywhere. And my mom, <laughs> funny enough, uh, she was the first graduate of the Darling University when they created the university. And she was... Dalian universities were extremely po famous for the Japanese language and literature. So she graduated uh, speaking full fluent Japanese. And my mom was used, to, used to be working for Mitsubishi, like general manager of China, Mitsubishi and all that. So my, fam my mom is always working, this working woman. And my dad is an entrepreneur. So they don't have time for me. <laughs> As a kid, I'm just running around with my, I live with my pa grandparents when I was very small. So they they kind of uh, you know that kind of influence, yeah. How did you feel about not seeing your parents? Because on one side you could say I see them hardworking, which makes which makes me a hardworking person because I have this example. But on the other hand, there's a lot of children who because they don't have the you know love or they don't see their parents, they kind of feel abandoned and they go the complete opposite route in their life, which is being very anxious and less confident about their future. Yeah, I, I don't see them in the sense that, you know, how in China you have now the parents from these really poor villages, they go to Shanghai and Beijing to work and they don't see the kids for a year, two years, right? When I say I don't see them, I don't see them on a daily basis, mm. but I see them every two or three days and the weekends they're always around. And, you know, we're li very close. They 15 minutes, uh, you, you can get to my parents' uh, place and my grandparents' place. So it's still very close. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's actually the norm in China. Um, at my age, um, the parents are, are really trying to create wealth and try to break the class barriers and then try to uh, let the kids be equipped with more resources. And that's in, re in exchange, I think, what I got is by 11, I was able to go out and, 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 and study abroad. Um, yeah. Well, why is wealth and money so important in the Chinese culture? Um, because 
that is the only thing that will protect you because other things doesn't protect people. Can you elaborate on that? Then it will get very political. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for it. Yeah. No, um, I think back in the days, you know, the, 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 I, I, I don't think the Chinese uh, police system and all that will protect someone uh, as much as wealth. I, I, you know, I, I don't think I want to get into too much politics for the sake of this podcast. But uh, ultimately, people believe that uh, what ultimately protects you is, is the wealth you create. Yeah. So basically, you are responsible for yourself. And the best way to be responsible for yourself is to make money, which actually is the case in a lot of countries. Yeah. If you think about it, and in a lot of developing countries yeah. where you can easily... I mean, I'm thinking about a bunch of countries around Singapore where you go and you can easily... I don't want to say bribe, but like kind of almost find a way out of anything when you have the money versus the people who don't have the money, which no, is... I think Singapore is completely different. Yeah, I'm saying people, yeah. uh, I'm saying countries around here, not here. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, Indonesia, you go to the Philippines, right. all these places where you have a bit of money and you're a king because you can kind of like, there's a lot of cool things you can do when you have money that you can't, when you don't, basically. No, it, it comes to the basic fundamental security of life, what you need, the medical, let's say. Mm. Um, in, in medical resources is so scarce in China that if you get sick and you don't have extra cash, you need to wait in line, you need to get, you know, uh, I mean, there is a very fundamental basic ones, but uh, it's, it's very poor in, in those sense. But when you have some money, you have the choice, let's say, come to Singapore to get treated or something. The wealth that you create gives you alternatives absolutely yeah so i think that is um what especially from a developing country back in the 1980s in china wealth can give you that so much opportunities um i think that's kind of what people is choosing for yeah. so they're basically looking for peace of mind yeah so you grow up mostly with your grandparents you see your parents every couple of days yeah but because your grandfather is extremely liberal you have this... My, my whole family is. The whole family. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, in China, if you write Chinese characters, I don't know if you know how to write, oh. <laughs> or, or kanji in Japanese, you need to use the right hand because the brush and the ink, once you write, it doesn't mess up, right? Mm -hmm. And also, with all the orders, um, you literally have to use your right hand to, to, to do any writing. But I'm left-handed. Even today, I write with my left hand which is so rare in China. But there's so many teachers came uh, when I was a kid to my parents and grandparents says, why, the f you know, you let him not <laughs> force him to change his hand. And this, my grandparents were like, hey, if he wants to write in his left hand, let him write in fucking left hand. He will take the consequence of messing up the writings. And now I never write because <laughs> everyone uses computers, but still I've kept left-handed. I'm, I'm still left-handed in everything. <laughs> and you yeah. think that most of the left-handed kids didn't have the same treatment as 99 you? 99% were, were always corrected to the right hand. Wow. I, I met so many people, they say, because when they see my, I, I use chopstick also, everyone's right hand. When you have a left-hander, yeah. you'll fight with the other person on your left, right? They're like, why, why, why do you use left hand? I'm, and, and they're surprised for me to use left hand on chopstick. And when I tell them I'm writing left hand too, everyone gets shocked uh, because that's, that's typically how the Chinese education would, would force you to change. And that's one thing my, my, my family just like, hey, you know, if, if he wants to do it, let him do it. <laughs> What's the consequence of 99% of the families forcing their kids to do things that are not kind of innate to their nature? I mean, I, I don't think there's consequence. It's just uh, I'm using that as a metaphor to say, uh, my family is not really traditional in the sense they don't always follow and they kind of challenge the authority at times, which to me, I think when you, when it comes to parenting, what things that the kids take away the most is how they interact with authority. How is your parents interacting with authority? Sometimes, sometimes they might be the authority themselves and sometimes they can also, uh, the way they interact with the teachers, the way they interact with government officials. Uh, because my family is a bit, you know, kind of a, um, uh, 
I don't know normally in a way that a lot of times they, they like to challenge the things. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I think in a way that it's because we're lucky because my grandparents was at that stage and my parents were doing their own things. So they have the boss to challenge. I think for majority of the family in, in, at the time, if they don't have that kind of uh, social hierarchy, whatever, they wouldn't have the boss to challenge, mm-hmm. which passed to me the, the the way of I do things. I don't always just follow orders. I, yeah. I you know, so I think that's what's really important. Yeah. You moved when you were 11 years old or 12 yeah, to 11, New Zealand. To New Zealand, yeah. Did you mo- decide to move or did your parents say, now it's time for you to leave? So my, my, <laughs> that's my dad. Because he does, what, that's what he does, right? At the time already. Yeah. And he looked at me and said, this kid's not going to survive in the Chinese uh, high school and university system because wow. it's extremely academic focused and it's extremely memorial based. You know how the China, it's, it's the only way for all, most of Chinese kids to break their social barrier is, is high school and they get to the university, that exam. Mm-hmm. That examination and that test is the most important thing in their life. Uh, if you s- come from the village and, and you want to get into Peking University, literally your whole life changes, your whole family changes. So everyone takes it so seriously and it's so competitive and it's so academic driven. It's insane. And my dad looked at me and says, this guy is not going to fucking make it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he started planning um, to influence me since I was about 10. So what he did is for every summer break, he would let me go to one country, stay there for two months by myself. So what was the first, how old were you the first time this happened? 10. 10, okay. Yeah, so he sent me to Australia uh, for two months. <laughs> I was in uh, uh, Brisbane at a, at, a, at a local language school, and I stayed at the local uh, host family for two months, just a vacation, just no, summer no, break. No English back then? You not, speak a, not, zero. A, not a word. Uh, like, he will be like, how are you? I'll be like, yes. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> no, he says, just go have fun. And, and how did you feel at 10 being basically you, sent tens of thousands of kilometers away? Yeah, no, my parents, they, they, they fly with me. They show me the school and okay. they knew the school principal very well. Okay. So it, it all kind of gradually all slided right. in. So I didn't, I never had the uh, uh, idea of feeling strange or anything. Okay. And I didn't know what they were up to. So <laughs> I stayed there for two months and they came back. They were like, how was that? I said, I hated it. Because I couldn't speak a word yeah. and I couldn't mingle and I was by myself and the host family um, was uh, was also challenging. Um, a lot of these host families, they're not, uh, they, 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 they treat it as a source of income. Of course. Yeah. Of so, course. So there yeah. are limitations on many things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, you only get to have half glass of milk in the morning. Uh, there's only very limited supply of things. Uh, and then like shower time is five minutes. Even more, the, literally the host mom come knock on the door because the, the use too much water, whatever. <laughs> so I wasn't used to that. I was like at home and was always fucking do my thing. And then uh, I hated it. So I came back and then uh, my dad said, oh, you know, uh, next year summer is going to be better. We'll send you to somewhere better. And then the so next time they sent me to New Zealand, uh, which is uh, by like 11, whatever, end of 10 years ago. Um, and also stay there for two, three months. This time I liked it a lot better because my English is getting a bit better. I can do very basic communication now. Mm. So I actually do get to see the place and enjoy. I have some, a few friends. And then I came back and then they were like, oh, you know, we can send you to Ireland the next year. They were planning maybe when I'm 12, 13 to move. I said, no, no, I like New Zealand. Um, maybe it's time to explore. So they're like, okay, then you go. <laughs> 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 so they sent you for five years there. They sent me not only five, I think five, six years. Yeah, I was I was there uh, completing all of the high school. And then uh, um, when it comes to university time or college time, I applied for many universities. And uh, one, I got a scholarship in the U.S., so I decided to go there. Yeah. How did, did the, how did the New Zealand experience impact your life and change your life later? Oh, it was tremendous. I think it was the biggest build-up uh, for a lot of things uh, in my life. Do you have examples? Um, Especially on the cultural side. I mean, you said like you come from a very different family and place in China. But the West, I mean, the Western and I mean, New Zealand culture extremely different from what you grew up in. No, I was young enough to not judge. 
when you you when you go somewhere at eleven, you just accept. Mm. You don't judge, right?、Um, I think when you become eighteen, nineteen, maybe you have your own.、Uh, so when I was from eleven to about seventeen, eighteen, which is the time in New Zealand, that's when I formed a lot of my own values, and and that's a lot of these values were independently formed because I was there alone.、Uh, I was there the whole time, stay at the whole different host families.、Mm. Um, And that also attributed a lot to to my values. I think、uh, I stayed at Mormon family for one year. I stayed at a、uh, uh, 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 you know very local New Zealand.、Family. I stayed at a South African family、uh, in New Zealand for one year. Wild lady.、Um, uh, and I stayed local Kiwi families and many different. Like every year, I, I would change a family. So essentially, I changed about five to six different families. And you see how different family you know, interacts. The South African family, the host mom, the mom,、uh, the host mom was very wild, partyish lady, crazy, and、uh, the dad is very quiet,、uh, Dutch、uh, um, uh, background guy, doesn't talk so much,、mm. very firm, and you just see funny things. I, I mean, there's a lot of things, but the whole time I think a lot of value was formed independently, was very important. I think. So that a lot of the life decisions I make, I make independently, and once I make them, I'm very firm on it because I'm very confident in the sense that it will work, right? I think that attributed to the entrepreneurship.、Uh, yeah. What are a few of these key values that you developed there that you still heavily rely on today? I think、um, one of the very key thing from New Zealand was that the people were down to earth. They're very direct and very straight, straight, in the sense they're direct and honest. And I think this is something I took away the most. I'm actually extremely direct. in In the company、uh, running、uh, in, in, at the company, sometimes I'm a bit blunt in a way that.、Um, but my goal is not to hurt, harm anyone. My goal is to just get shit done. Be, to 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 be most efficient、mm. because、uh, when it comes to running a company, it is a Hierarchy dictator、uh, form of organization, and actually, what you are chasing for is the maximum efficiency,、mm. right? And、uh, sometimes, because of that, you lose a little bit of、uh, other things. Whereas, if you're running a political party、uh, for the people, that's completely reversed for me. So, I think,、um, anyways, at the company,、uh, I'm, I'm very direct, and、uh, in, in a way that also、um, we're very honest. To I'm very honest to to my team and to、uh, whoever we deal with,、uh, try to open up and、uh, tell them exactly my thinking process. And when when they see you actually open up and they understand that you're actually trying to help them, being very direct and they accept it rather than fight with you. So I think that's something、uh, I learned the most. The honesty one is super interesting because I'm super direct and super honest, but most people are not.、Mm. Right, and it's very easy to hurt people. And even if you explain to them, my goal is to be extremely direct because I want to be more efficient. Exactly the same. They might say yes, I understand, but they don't really because they've grown up in a very different way. Right. So how do you deal with that? Also, I think being honest is is the is the most and efficient and energy saving because when you try to lie, you have to back up that, and you have to always remember your lie at which point, and then you have to keep <laughs> doing all that shit. It's, <laughs> I think, it's a personality choice as well. Is that you just can't be bothered to deal with that shit, and why not just be more direct and and, and、uh, be, be be honest about, about things? Yeah, makes complete sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely happened a few times where you're trying to like make people. Feel better by by kind of lying,、yeah. white lying, and then you start、yeah. to like get caught in your lies because it just doesn't make sense anymore what you're saying、yeah. in your story. No, I think what we're referring to also it's it's like when you certain things, social gatherings. I mean that doesn't count. I think it's just like, hey, you look good today, you know, whatever. But when it comes to actual things, business wise, and things you deal with the people close to you, I, you, you I, yeah, I don't lie. You moved to the U.S. You said you applied to a few schools. Yeah. What happened then? So you know,、um, after high school,、uh, I was facing a choice: like, where do I go, right, for college? I, I got accepted by a local school in New Zealand,、mm-hmm. one of the best. It's called Canterbury, in、uh, in in Christchurch, and、um, 
but I feel like it's time to go to a place where it's more diversity, more exposure of uh, a lot of different things. Um, you know, uh, I was looking at UK, I was looking at US, but I think ultimately US came stand out because they do offer very attractive scholarships compared to UK's um, or any other uh, schools. Um, and also is a lot more exposure, I feel like. So in the end, uh, when I got the offers, um, I got a few offers from the US schools. Um, the one was the highest scholarship, almost full scholarship. Um, and um, so I decided to go there. Yeah. The one with the highest scholarship. Yeah. Where was it? It was in Indiana. Why is the U.S. so important for Asian students in general? So the other day I was talking with, uh, it was with Annabelle from uh, Amber Group. Oh, yeah, I know her very well. Yeah. And um, she was here, basically. And um, she said that I think top choices are UK, number one, and then the U.S., And then Singapore, number three. Do you know why? Um, to be honest, I think to most people, number one is US. Yeah. UK is probably number okay. two. Um, and, then, uh, and then you have like Switzerland. I think typically the West is it's preferred because you're Asian, you want to get exposed, right? If you just tell people you go to Singapore, it's, it's, it's good, but it's not as, as cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and because U.S. is leading in so many fronts, like entertainment, uh, uh, fashion, design, uh, financials. So whatever you study, um, the U.S. seems to have the top notch in that area. Unless, unless you, you study, I don't know, learn Europe history, maybe UK is, is, is leading, I don't know. And a few other areas, I'm sure UK is very strong. But if you look at the school, uh, I think mostly people are thinking about the schools, the Ivy League and all that. And um, it, it, it's a bragging thing also for the, for the parents to go out and say, oh, my kid you know, go, goes to US and got a scholarship and all that. <laughs> yeah. Which you never had because your parents didn't really care about that. Uh, my parents do care about that a lot. They love to brag. They love to brag. Yes. Still. Okay. Because yeah, you still. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you made them very proud by going there and then you decided to stay there for your first job. Um, uh, yeah. So after I graduate, um, I was, I went, I was like, well, I face another choice coming back to China or by the time a lot of kids were going back to China right after graduate, not by choice because they had no other choice, but go back. So I don't want to be going back because it's an easy way out. So I said, if I need to look for a job, whether in the U.S. or China, I need to look for a job. So I started looking for jobs in the U.S. Before, you know, and I found one. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, I, I went to this uh, in, in New York. First of all, I, I picked a city. So after graduate, I said, where do I want to go? Let's go to New York. New York is, is happening. It's cool. Yeah, that, that's it. That was the it's only the rationale. It's the coolest place in the coolest country. It's, it's cool. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's far away from, uh, from my, my school because I don't want to be anywhere near like Chicago and all these places. It's too close. We used to go there party all the time. So I want to go somewhere far away. And, and, and our school is a very, very small town in, in Indiana. So I want to go to a big city. And that's why I knew, I'm like, I've been to fucking U.S. for so long now, four years. I never live in a big city. So I need to go to where the fucking movie is and shit. And I still go to New York and I start looking for a job. And I found one. Um, it's, uh, it's like a supply chain company. Uh, and I was, I was uh, <laughs> recruited as a, 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 a procurement agent. Mm. So I was buying and selling and logging into the SAP system and all that. Yeah, yeah. How did you find this job? I mean, in terms of how fulfilled were you in this job? I wasn't fulfilled at all. It was, it was a very basic execution guy, right? It was good, you know, you, you mingle with the coworkers. Mm -hmm. and it's so slow, yeah? You go there at, I don't know, 10 o'clock, and uh, you just sit down. My neighbor next door was this girl from... Uh, He's, she's from the U.S., but traditional, I think, original background was India or somewhere. 
and she's this really cheerful person and she was just make laughing really loud and talk with all the people in the cubicle and everyone just have a laugh so it's it's a good time i was there for eight months pretty much and doing the thing and gradually understand more about the system and i figure out but it's daily you know they're just punching things in and it's more or less to do is gradually moved into inventory management mm. to check the uh, uh, stock level of things and then you feel it you not feel it you place the order so gradually do all that yeah you told me you felt not great very quickly because you were feeling like you're part of this big machine oh yeah yeah well but, but I, i just graduated so i wasn't looking to start a whole empire by then right but what i want to do is i always had things i want to move up i i wasn't happy with just just sitting there and and having fun with the cubicle people, which I think the people near me are very enjoying the daily. Yeah. And they sit there, they talk about the vacation <laughs> in Bahamas and things. I'm like, dude, I'm That's... not interested in that <laughs> shit at all. I want to move up. I want to make some more money uh, because I was making, um, I think $4,000 or $5,000 a month uh, at the time. Maybe less, maybe $3,500, I forgot, mm -hmm. because as a fresh graduate. Uh, what came is really interesting is So after five months, I would go to the manager. Uh, I see this guy. This guy's called Greg, uh, a typical American uh, guy. And he seems very calm, uh, very quiet. But I see him uh, riding a, a BMW motorcycle to, to, to the office every day. So he's got the wild side. <laughs> and I figured, I bet he's probably not going to take offense if I'm too aggressive. So I knock on his door once. I said, Greg, you know, you probably don't know me. I just worked here for six months. But if there's any opportunities, I want to take on more responsibilities. So that's what I said. And he said, oh, all right, your name? As I told him, my name is now. Okay. I actually, something happened. So three months later, he come to me and says, hey, uh, you know, Ben, come over. We have, we have some opportunity that came up. They are starting a new, new project in China. And, uh, and this project is, is handling the avionics in China the, for planes. And it's Honeywell, Eaton, and all these guys. They make the the brakes and the wheels for the the plane, uh, and they need a procurement, the whole system set up for filling their orders. So they said, we need to send someone to China, and we need someone to speak fucking Chinese. <laughs> and he says, you want to try it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll try it. How much? <laughs> you gonna give me? I'll give you a raise. You know, <laughs> they can give you a raise, and they send me back to Suzhou. <laughs> which is the chi which is city right next to Shanghai. Beautiful city. Yeah. What's your advice to all the 20 or 21 years old, impatient, young, freshly grads out there who feel that they're working for, you know, big company and it's not going fast enough? No, I think first, congratulations, you have that feel. I think that feeling is what drives everything. I think it's the lack of that feeling Mm. that most people have. So the moment you actually start thinking of that, you, you're good. You're good to go. And just be, you know, be direct and, and, and maybe you can express yourself more. If people don't see you, make them see you. And, and so what I did was just tell the manager, hey, I want to take on more responsibilities. Uh, and that's it, I think. And they, noticed. Send, yeah. and they send you to Suzhou? Yeah, so I, they sent me to Suzhou. Yeah. I, was, I was in Suzhou. And... Um, Yeah, and, and I was there for maybe uh, six months. There was a bit of conflict as well because I represent the, the, the supply chain side of the business, which got acquired by a very big company called Westco. And they had a general manager of Westco in, uh, in Suzhou. Uh, the moment I come in, uh, I don't report to her. And she hated the fact that I don't report to her. Uh, but the whole company acquired my, my company. Mm -hmm. And she just want to know everything I do. And she's been busting my balls. And the moment I step in, she's trying to establish her authority over me. She says, hey, Ben, you need to report to me now. Uh, I need to know what's going on. I said, no, no, I don't report to you. And uh, I said, uh, oh, okay, w what about these traveling expenses? Because at the end of the day, she can have control of my expenses. But I don't know. I get approved by my manager and you just pay it. <laughs> and so in the end, there was a lot of politics, which I also hate. Mm. And and the project didn't really take off. It became never took off. Uh, but it was a good stepping stone for me to go back to China to see what China is like. 
with a good job, a stable income. Back then, they would, they, I think they gave me a raise to $6,000 or $7,000. With $7,000 in China, it's fucking good. It's, it's like mm -hmm. really good manager, higher manager type of salary already. And I was like 20, 22, 23, right? So it, it, and I, I didn't do, I don't need to do much. Every day, just politics with the fucking manager and tiny little things. So I have all this time. So I was sitting there and just doing research on what the fuck should I do next? Because <laughs> obviously I'm not going to grow within this company you know, because this fucking bitch is all over my ass <laughs> and I'm trying to fight her. And then, so I was doing research. And then uh, another day I had a call with my, my friend in, in Japan because I went to Waseda for one year exchange program uh, in college in, in Japan, in Tokyo, and party and all that shit. And he says, hey, you know what, Ben? Um, this, co this company called the Forex company. They are looking to enter China. They need a translator. <laughs> like you want to pick up uh, some translation job for like, I don't know, 50 bucks an hour or whatever. Mm. So yeah, fuck, why not? I got nothing to do. Uh, and then I was translating. So side hustle. Yeah, side hustle. <laughs> translating only. <laughs> no, after I translate, I, I, I got an interview with, with the company. Now it's called XM. XM is probably the top three in the world now for mm. Forex. They're massive. They have license in the US, uh, UK, everywhere. Um, but back then, they only had four or five people. It was a CEO called me <laughs> and had an interview. Say, hey, you know what? I, it seems like your translation is not bad. Why don't you start contacting these uh, potential uh, partners or affiliates to promote our, our platform? I'm like, oh, you want me to promote now? And then what, what, what's the deal? And they're like, hey, we'll give you a commission. we give you some fixed salaries. You do all that shit. Just explore. I said, yeah, let's fucking do it. And I start doing it. Two jobs at the same time. No, no, no. So once I decided to take on that one, okay. uh, uh, before I decided to do some research, how many potential clients I could have, it seems interesting. So I, I basically came and says, look, this will require like a full-time job now. So bef before I fully commit, I, I only sent emails to these guys. And I sent emails and they responded. I feel like, oh, this is not bad. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why when I quit. I said, hey, uh, to, to the U.S. company, I said, uh, adios, guys, I'm, I'm gone. And uh, well, I'm where the, the general manager was very happy to see me gone. <laughs> The pain in the ass is gone now. <laughs> <laughs> so you start to work with this um, Forex company full time and then you discovered something. Yeah, we, 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 I was in Suzhou. I was trying to sign up affiliates, mm. partners, basically these websites that talks about how to trade Forex in China. Back then it was the golden age for Forex in China. It was 2010 is when all the new platform did start to emerge um, and we were luckily the one of the early ones as well in that during that period and I really it took off and, and clients start to come in and I had one day after like the first week the the CEO called me shav shaving uh, shaking uh, it was like oh we have such a big client now from China he deposited like ten thousand dollars You know, which which is pretty big for mm. even the uh, the company level. Mm. They never expect China have such a big client. They would expect China have like five dollar, ten dollar clients. Mm. And it's, it's fucking Chinese. They were like, "Whoa, damn, this market is big. You need to go harder." You know? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> What's the difference between? Because I want to talk about obviously this is forex, right? But then you start to realize there is a big opportunity there and you have these people, for example, this person depositing $10,000. Right. What is this person looking for by depositing $10,000 in a Forex account? Um, it was, listen, it was 2010 where China already became very wealthy, the middle class. Mm -hmm. And the investment option in China is very limited. Uh, you have like Chinese stocks, which is not performing. You and they have some fund they could buy uh, that gives them maybe fifteen percent yield a year. The banks doesn't give so much, so people are desperately looking for ways to invest and and to basically make a not fixed return, but potential doubling or thirty percent, fifty percent gain. Uh, and, and so basically, forex offered a leverage trading platform. For, for the Chinese community, especially in the middle class. 
and especially the people who build uh, factories and things, and they have uh, they start to get exposed with forex. They are collecting American dollars, and they start to get a concept of foreign exchange. Like, oh, I'm collecting dollars. Oh, when can I change to RMB or RMB change to all that? And then they were like, oh, what if I get some leverage on it? I, I start trading it, right? And and there's good profit. So then people are looking for uh, platforms. Uh, obviously, you cannot go to the bank to do that because China limits the the the, the capital uh, in and out flow. So these retail facing broker, uh, which is the platform I was running, uh, became very attractive. It gives them exposure of forex, uh, but without necessarily uh, moving money around and and also very high leverage. The leverage could go up to five hundred. So if you you use the five hundred leverage. To trade a, a euro, a euro, you know, euro dollar pair or a Japanese yen dollar pair, it's pretty attractive. It goes up and down like crazy, right? Um, so that's that's something that got people. And then what happened is simultaneously, there were so many agents that start to form, like agents, people t- teaching uh, uh, retailers how to trade mm. forex. And there was you can see uh, there was seminars, there's offline online courses at first tier city second tier and third tier level in china you have first tier is shanghai beijing yep. second tier is like suzhou third tier is much smaller provinces and all that yeah you have things coming and people were just really kind of got interested uh, and so from 2010 to 2000 i would say 17 no 16 probably the six years is the golden years for forex in china and from 16 they start to crack down very very aggressively yeah What's the difference between high leverage and gambling? Because most of these people who came there, their goal was to make, or their dream was to make a lot of money quickly, right? And there is definitely a gambling aspect to that. Yeah. I guess the difference is in gambling, maybe the house always won. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between trading stock? Because stock could be gambling as well. So any form of investment uh, could be treated gambling. But I think the difference with a gambling place is that there's an edge, ultimately, a statistical edge to the house. Mm. That's not really fair. So I think, uh, well, in, even in Forex, still there are a lot of what we call the brokers that do make them have an edge. But there's there are brokers who are regulated that cannot do that, and it's completely fair game. So you make your own shot and you 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 take the cons- consequence. And typically, if you are trading and if you're very disciplined, you can actually manage to make some good money. And there are a lot of professional companies and, and firms that does that. So I think it, it offers the gambling aspect. But again, if you're simply looking for gambling, uh, there are many other choices as well. So I wouldn't classify Forex as pure gambling, but it definitely has the gambling aspect. The same as crypto, right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why is gambling such a big thing in Asia? It's definitely everywhere, but in Asia, I realized I have a lot of friends who's, especially father, is big into gambling and actually often bad things happen. What's the cultural aspect there that makes gambling more prevalent here? In Asia, um, <clears throat> I think there's many aspects to it. Number one is probably just historically speaking, <laughs> gambling has been part of Chinese culture for s- back to centuries ago, right? Like I don't all the dynasties. There's gambling is legal. So actually, China historically, if you look at the the history, which impact o- overall Asia, right? Uh, it's very liberal in the sense that prostitution, gambling were legal before the Communist Party. They were part of life. There's proper gambling houses everywhere, and there's proper prostitution places, uh, like license, whatever, uh, centuries ago, right? So, so that's one historical aspect, right? But it doesn't explain why people go crazy now, right? So I think people go crazy now, it's... And I was lo- looking at this documentary saying that in China now, like young people, if you graduate school, um, the unemployment rate is as high as 40% in, in China. And it's the same as 
Korea, they say is the age this generation is is caged, you know. And in order to break the barrier, you people are all looking for fast money, and uh, gambling became one aspect because they simply don't see the future and the hope by collecting monthly salaries. They do a calculation; it will take them thirty years to buy a small apartment in Shanghai or so. Uh, uh, would you take the chance? And then all of the social media are are are, are showing you all of the kids who made it driving a Lambo, uh, you know, uh, and you're just looking at them and you're like, well, how am I, how am I going to become them? Mm. Uh, because I can already see my road here. It's 20, 30 years now. I can see it clearly. I'm just going to be a fucking nobody. Would I just gamble and take a shot? Why not? You know, so I think that's a lot of it to do with the current society is not offering a, a opportunity. Uh, I guess it's very competitive in a sense. Um, yeah. What would you do if you have your 19 year old kid? You are from a very average family. Let's hypothesize. Let's make the hypothesis that you're from a very average family. You didn't do that well in your life, and your 19 years old kid comes to you and shows you this. Oh, look on social media. There is this person who made it am amazingly well. This is my future here, but I could do this gambling th uh, thing here, which could give me a shot. But you also know, let's say that you also know about investing, which people who build wealth know about, right? Long-term investing and long-term investing usually is proven to work better than gambling in terms of chances. It takes you more time, but it works better, right? What would you tell your kid to do? Uh, my kid. Yeah. If the family is very... Very uh, average. average or, yeah, yeah, exactly. And... Um, my, my, my kids come to me. Hmm. That's a lot of assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> that are not true today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I probably first figured out why I should, why would I provide more opportunities for my kid mm -hmm. for him to come up this fucking question? Yeah. I would feel pretty bad. <laughs> number one. Uh, number two is probably, I don't know. It's going to be very hard. I, I don't want to judge uh, because I'm, I feel like I'm privileged. And uh, I, you cannot judge another person who is not as privileged as you um, or use your position to say, why don't you tell your kid to do the longer or the better or the right thing? Uh, it's the same as like, you know how a lot of people say, that, you know, Chinese, the parents, like Singapore, you have this phrase of tiger mom or whatever, cougar mom or not cougar, tiger, whatever, to be very strict. On the on the on the on the kid, right? <laughs> um, you can't really judge them because you're not in their shoes because they might be struggling with, with at work, uh, struggling. They already see their future down the road, and all they want is to for their kids to break that barrier, and so they push extra hard on the kid. But if you are from a, a privileged uh, family or you are privileged yourself, you go there. Oh, why don't you tell your kids to relax? Typically, it's, you're not in the shoes to do that because you understand your struggles. Mm. So I don't think I, I'm in the position to comment on that. Um, but again, if it was my kid uh, and my shoe, um, it, you know, I will follow my instinct. But uh, I, yeah, I don't think I can comment. Yeah. You said that the golden era of um, Forex kind of ended up around 2017 or 16, 16 in China. Yeah. That's when they started arresting people. Why did they do that? Uh, be because of the leverage too high. Number one. And number two, China was never prepared to deal with any form of foreign for, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> forex uh, trading. So even today, there's no forex trading. Forex trading, even with five leverage, is banned. Mm -hmm. There isn't a, a, a license or regime to allow any form of uh, forex trading. Forex to Chinese government is just a way to get money out of China. Mm. And so they completely ban it. Uh, they just don't like to hear the word and don't like to see it, right? And and especially you have high leverage with it, right? Um, and, and so it's it's a privilege that only allows the bank to have if you need to exchange money, go to the bank. So China wasn't prepared to make a commodity or a derivative out of that uh, and therefore, uh, they start cracking down all of these uh, forex firms. Yeah, a lot of my old friends are now lost contact or probably in jail. 
uh, at the time. Yeah. So you're part of this super, I mean, this growing company, super successful. And then there is this crackdown from the Chinese government. Yeah. What did you do? I mean, so by 16, it became very dangerous. Um, and there was, my energy was never focused on growing the company anymore. Again, uh, if, if the direction was not something I'm interested in, I, I typically just say, hey, I need to do my thing. What I spent the most of my energy on back in 2016 was to dealing with client distribute, client uh, uh, complaints, because the clients are so smart. They realize you're scared of the government. So if they lose money, they'll just come to the office and they will do crazy things to disrupt your operation. Uh, and they know you won't call the police because if you call, you would be exposing your operation and they will assume you're scared. What's the craziest thing you've experienced in the office? In and out of office, out of the office, I was abducted once. In the office, uh, the typical people would imagine that they come in and create, no, 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 they come in, they shut down the electricity. They, you know, the electricity, they look for the electricity, they shut it down. And what they do is they come, they don't come into the office. They get a big lock, they lock the office from outside. So you cannot go out. And you have to negotiate at the door with them because they be like, you don't want... If you don't settle, I'm not going to let you out. <laughs> mm. You know, they're so aggressive in, in a way. We had clients who come in the office, open the window and says, if you don't get money, she's going to jump down. And we're like 15th floor. And she's like, do you want to take the risk of me not even jumping down? I'm just breaking my leg or something. And then, and then I'll call the police. Mm. And the police find out you're doing fucking Forex. Mm. And you caused me to do that. The shit you're going to handle and the trouble. And in the end, it's just so fucking crazy. Yeah. And, and this was happening to all the Forex firms. And, and it became so bad. You know, street, before that, every, everything was open. The office was open. We were welcome. Everyone, completely legit. Until the government started cracking down and everyone realized, ah, if I lose money, I can actually do something. And then that's when these things got really bad. <laughs> What did you do then? Huh? What did you do then? Ah, you calm them down, you have tea with them, you take them out for dinner, and eventually you became friends. <laughs> and and But... what's really funny, <laughs> what's really funny is that a lot of times in the end, it's not a client. It's the client hired these companies. In the end, I know all of them. And you be... When they came like, hey, Joe, you're here again. He's like, hey, fucking Ben, yeah, I'm here again. Okay, this time <laughs> is this client's. How are we going to do this? I'm like, look, last time was 60-40. This time, let's... <laughs> Give me more, 70, 30. He said, no, man, this client's fucking tough, blah, blah, blah. And he's okay, I need to pretend tough. Take a few for pictures. Let me fucking show the strengths. Okay, okay, do it. It's all staged. In the end, it was so funny, but it was so annoying that I didn't, I, I, I could not focus on growing. The, and I know the whole industry is dying. So there was no point. Yeah. In China, in China, yeah. And at the same time, or around the same time, there is this crazy crypto bull run, 2016, 2017. Yeah, so that's when I saw the opportunity. I was like, okay, this fucking industry is dying. Mm -hmm. I need to look for something new, It excites me. And then um, I heard about Bitcoin in 15, you know, and people say Bitcoin is a fucking scam, yeah. Um, so you thought it was a scam too? Yeah, so it was a scam. And, and by 17, what changed is that all the smart people around me are getting to crypto. And that's when you realize these people are smart. I don't think these people will fall into a scam. So this must be something in it. So I decided to check it out. <laughs> yeah. What did you do from there? What, what made you go from leaving this first company to starting Bybit? Uh, well, actually, it was leaving the company first. I didn't have a plan. Um, because, the, you know, the whole complaint was so bad. I don't see a future in the industry in China, and I don't plan to do anything. Uh, I could still do Forex outside of China, but I feel like uh, I'm, I'm seven years in this industry. I just feel like when I, the moment I saw crypto and I get into it, I was like, this is the shit. This is so much more. It's going to be so much bigger than Forex. So I immediately just want to quit. And uh, The reason I want to quit is I want all of my ener energy to be spent in crypto. So I just called my boss. I said, I'm quitting. And he says, oh, you know, we can give you a raise. We can give you uh, different things and different responsibilities. I said, no, no, no. I mean, number one is getting too dangerous. Number two is uh, I, I see something I really want to give all myself into. 
So they understand and we, we part ways peacefully. And from that point on, I was so into crypto. I was looking at uh, crypto from uh, the in the morning until back in two in, the, in at night. <laughs> I was so into it. A classic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the beginning, right? For like whole fucking half year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What did you look at? Just the charts or because no. everything was going crazy, you were like, oh man, like these coins are doing 10x in like one Yeah, week. yeah. I think what 2016 and 17, it was ICO. It was the first time you mm -hmm. can do ICO. Ethereum came out. Although it was full of scam and I lost so much money um, in that. <laughs> But it was an age of inspiration. Mm. Uh, I feel people who come in during that time was lucky because it was people trying to decentralize everything. Decentralized coffee, decentralized traffic, decentralized projectors. Anything they can put a decentralized on, they would do and make a project and try to ICO, right? And try to raise money. <laughs> so in the way that it opened up the world, you're like, holy shit, everything can be decentralized. What's the most ridiculous project you remember that tried to decentralize something that was complete nonsense? Um, no, it was, it was all, <laughs> let me, let me think, let me think. I mean, there was some, some very big topic. There was a very big ambitious project trying to decentralize the whole supply chain, right? Mm. Uh, moving salmon from Norway to China. Uh, and I think specific cases, like the salmon is going to get here But, <laughs> with a little scanner. With, and then, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, the salmon when it's in the water and <laughs> all the, All the white paper wrote in such a detail that it's like, oh, fuck, this shit will work, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it was also not only blockchain, it was IoT. Yeah, IoT. Yeah. Uh, so it was combining with IoT scanners. Uh, there was one project I remember trying to decentralize, decentralize uh, Apple App Store, which I understand is a pain because they monopolize that shit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, fuck, let's decentralize it, you know, do this and that. And then it was decentralized, I think, uh, mobile services like T-Mobile and something like that. Uh, and then there was uh, a bit of gaming but all over the place. So it, 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 if you get into crypto then, all your time is spent on reading white papers and reading um, people's ideas. And you get excited. It's like uh, cocaine. You fucking get sniffed every other day. This new cocaine coming in. You're like, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's take a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, everyone was was hyped. Yeah, total hyped. <laughs> When does the Bybit ID come to your mind? It's actually we started with a business that's fairly similar to what you were doing before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So I was hyped up for like six months and bought a bunch of shit coins and they start dumping and reality slap you in the face. And you realize, oh shit, okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's when I stopped looking at white papers, <laughs> the projects. I was like, okay, so what this, what actually works in the industry? Mm. What is one application has been adopted and proven? Because then you kind of, you kind of a little bit, Shocked that all this shit is fake. Yeah. You really, I, I fucking give up my old job and I'm gonna, this is a fucking scam. <laughs> actually, no, there's actually real things happening, real volume happening, real trading happening. So I start looking into that. And then it was uh, BitMax, uh, OKX at the time who did derivative trading. Mm. And you have spot exchange like Binance, right? Binance established a little bit later. So I'm like, well, what I do is Forex. I know how to build a Forex broker and exchange and I'm very good at it. And I feel like, I need to use my old talent. And I look at the real application was the exchange. So I tried the exchange at the time. There was issues. There was uh, overload. There was, uh, um, you know, here and there, but I think real issues. But more, more importantly is I want to get into the industry. And this is one of the handles I could. So, um, you know, I, I tried um, the exchange. I didn't like the user interface. Uh, I feel like Forex is a lot more advanced in the sense to retail is very easy or very intuitive, right? Um, uh, and so that's why I decided to to build Bybit. Yeah. So you decided to build Bybit. And there's probably a few other teams that are trying to build something similar back mm. then. But you managed to build in five years? Five years, yeah. A huge company with more than, you said, one point. 
1,300 uh, employees, more than 6 million customers. No, 20 million. We're 20, 20 million, million now. now. Yeah. So 20 million customers. Yeah. You have offices in 10 countries? Uh, no, we have Hong Kong, Singapore, and Dubai. How the hell did you do this? Like, take me back to the beginning of the Bybit journey to understand how you managed to achieve something that big in that 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 of a short time. Um, yeah, I think you 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 start to try to fix a problem. Um, the problem back then was exchange would get shut down or overloaded when market moves. So that is the problem we we were trying to solve. Um, um, and um, in, in initially, um, it, it was very hard because no none of us knew what derivative trading is. And, and crypto and Forex, to me, is two completely different things. Even until today, I couldn't utilize any of my Forex resources, uh, people, or contact, not a single one of them. So you thought, ah, oh, it's similar, I'm good at this shit, but actually you realize it's very different. It, yes, doing... in terms of resources, it's completely different and it's zero relevancy. But in terms of philosophy to run and the, and the, and, and the way to attract clients, it's the same. Mm. Uh, and so that is the most thing I learned uh, from back in the days. Because Forex is a broker model. It's, it's broker meaning that you're connected to exchange. But here we are building exchange. Um, so it's, you need to actually have product and engineer and coders to build the product. Whereas Forex, none of the firms have developers because everything is ready. You can pick, you can choose. There's a bunch of, uh, uh, companies and, re, uh, and suppliers to make, make the all, all modulized for you, mm -hmm. whatever you want, you just pick and choose. Mm -hmm. So Forex is all about user acquisition. Uh, marketing and uh, and how to run the firm. So these are the things I'm good at. Mm. Yeah, uh, when but when you go, when you first come in, you're like, damn, you have to build this thing. You have to. There's nobody can provide it. There's no white labeling service, and then there was nobody knew how to build this thing. And you come in, you you trying to say you're gonna build something better than Bitmax? Get the fuck out of here! <laughs> like that's all the investors say when it comes to I'm trying to one solve one problem. Is that you know exchange have overload issues and shit? The investors, dude, they dreaming. Bitmax is like seventy percent of the fucking world. Yeah. They have all the money in the world, and you telling me you can solve a problem better than them? And you have what, like ten people and and you know coming out of fucking China and shit. So, so it was very hard to raise money, um, and also because the market was down. Um, but yeah, that that was the initial goal was to solve that problem. Um, uh, and as to say, to say, I remember uh, Arthur used to say on the podcast, it's like, these people claim they can solve it because they don't have the same user as BitMax. The moment you have same, you, would, you wouldn't be able to solve it. <laughs> so that was, it was, it was really funny. Yeah. Because, because of what? Because people using, because their clients were because using they have so more many leverage? Clients. So that's more. why they, okay. they, they overload and whatever. Um, but um, I think BitMax eventually managed to solve their problem. But you know, I, I think what um, what was really I was really grateful is that uh, actually uh, Bitmax at the time and OKX at the time, well, all the exchange, were very transparent about how the exchange is built in terms of all the formulas, in terms of all the mechanism. It was explained in a very transparent way. I think this is the fundamental of of blockchain and crypto. Is the transparency of things, right? Like you, you wouldn't go to CME to to for, expect them to give you all the how they calculate their insurance pool, how the liquidation engine works. Mm. They they fuck. They were like no. So as an off, yeah. but initially this is as an education for their customers, right? Yes. Online. Yes. And then you can use that to understand. Ah, oh, that's how they're doing that. It makes sense. Or actually, ah, oh, it doesn't make sense. We could do it better. Exactly. Exactly. Because uh, it was so new also to the customers. Mm. I think if the exchange yeah. is, doesn't come transparent, nobody will trust them. But because it was so transparent, that leaves our, uh, people to catch to them. Because people like us, we would just spend days and days uh, reading through the other exchange documents and try to understand 
what is this perpetual contract? Like, we didn't know what is what the fuck's perpetual contract. <laughs> it sounds so strange. Like, mm. I, all I know is margin trading at the time. And I look, I get the engineer, they're like, oh yeah, there's this thing called funding fee. There's this thing called uh, insurance pool. There's this thing called auto deleveraging. I'm like, guys, speak fucking Chinese at the time. Speak Chinese to me <laughs> because I don't fucking understand a word you're saying. They're like, fuck, man, this shit is complicated. <laughs> this is something that we've never seen be like before. I'm like, get your shit together and let's do it. So we got a team to stay at the office for eight months. Nobody allowed to go home. Just fucking crank that shit down. <laughs> and then the, eventually sleeping we- Sleeping in the office. Sleeping in the office and all that shit. Eventually they managed to launch it uh, end of 2028. Uh, and that's why our first product was the BTC USD inverse contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the first product we launched. So you said 2020, you launched that? 28. 28. 2020. Oh, sorry, 2018. 18, sorry, right? sorry, sorry. 2018, 18, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, 18, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, but there is still this, I mean, because that's the golden years of BitMEX, actually. Oh, yeah. 2018, they're larger 2019. Than, they're larger than Binance. Actually, yeah. we talked about that with Arthur on the podcast. The golden moment of BitMEX was the bear market, which was absolutely amazing because everybody's struggling in crypto, except them and they're like oh yeah. man it's amazing it's a bear market but we're printing money because you know yeah. whether it goes up or down we can make money yeah how do you how do you attract liquidity and bootstrap liquidity on an exchange when you start and there is better options or at least better marketed options out there yeah so that that was the biggest issue that all the new exchange would face uh, but it's even harder today because all the exchanges today have a massive product line that they've, they've been building for five, six years, mm. nonstop. But back in the days, um, first one, the, the product was all about the perpetual contract, right? I think BitMEX had six pairs or five pairs, all inverse contract. Uh, and so that is the golden standard. The, if you have an inverse contract, you can sort of compete. Today, if you only have a universe card, get the fuck out. You need to have credit card, you need to have fiat, you need to have mm -hmm. earned product, you need to have all this complicated shit in order to even to get a start. So back then was the golden age for exchange to, you know, you figured it out. Uh, but after the first product we launched, uh, we didn't get any clients for two months, three months. And uh, I look at the book, I, I told the team, guys, we have three more months. If we don't get clients in three more months, the company is shutting down. Uh, so I made a I made a very bold not because the whole time I was my when Bible started it was really funny I already had my business development team I already had my marketing team ready I had like fifteen people ready mm. and when we finally find the CTO he was shocked he was like you guys are the first startup I see with no product nothing to sell but you have a sales team. We have a sales team yeah. ready to go, but nobody knew what we were selling. And so we, we got them in. We said, I want fucking, you know, uh, sell fucking BitMEX and do the perpetual contract. That's when they started cranking down and design. But the whole time, my marketing sales was ready, on standby. So we, I told them fucking do some research and, and we start understand the market. What I realized was uh, affiliate marketing was a huge opportunity. Mm. Uh, the reason is that you look at BitMEX and uh, OKX at the time, or all the exchange at the time, they had one thing called referral program. And it's such a simple page. You go, it's a link. You copy the link, you promote, and you get a discount if your clients, uh, if the client joins under you and you earn some commission. Yeah. That's it. You don't know how it's been made. You don't know how it's been calculated. And you just get told you made a commission. As so simple as that. So what that means is all the influencers and people with power and clients, they don't understand how they make money with their clients, how to convert. So the result is if you contact all of them, the YouTubers, the, the Twitter, we start contacting. We're like, hey, we have an exchange to promote, but it's not yet ready. But tell us how you want to promote it. Mm. They're like, oh, we charge pay per shield, which is like $500 per mention, mm. uh, $500 per video. Mm. All of them. And I just started, I, I was like, this is the biggest opportunity I saw. Mm. I'm like, that means these fuckers don't understand their potential to convert. Because if you go to Forex, all of these affiliates are on commission-based. 
And nobody will charge you pay per shield because it's nothing. It's peanuts. If you're on a commission base, you make so much more and you become so aggressive and you become so much bigger. Um, so that's when I, okay, guys, I told the team once we build the BTC inverse, it's not going to work. Nobody comes as, okay, all of us, because everyone in the team said, Ben, we need the second pair. We only have one pair. We now need Ethereum. Mm -hmm. It's it's the normal logic to copy BMAX to follow the second pair, the third pair. I'm like, guys, nobody gives shit about if we have a second or a third mm -hmm. because nobody knows who the fuck you are. You need to get people to start talking to Bybit. <laughs> So let's get these fuck uh, these uh, uh, affiliates, uh, shillers, to fucking shill. And, and they're like, well, how do we get them? We need to build them a CRM so they understand what the fuck they're doing. So I told all the developers, get your shit together. We are stop building the exchange. Build me the affiliate portal. Now, that is the first thing Bybit revolutionized the whole industry. We were the first one to come up with such a comprehensive affiliate portal. Now everyone has, and everyone copied Bybit. Mm. Uh, so when we came out with that, it took about two months. And then I flew in a few big influencers to our office to check it out. When they see that, they went crazy. Because our CRM, they can generate links they want. How many clicks on the link happened? How many became sign up? How many became depositings? How many was traded, commissioned? How was generated? Everything was crystal clear. Mm. And we tell them, look, I'll pay you per shield, but use your ref link. Mm. Use a ref link, you start generating profit and money commission, and you see how it works. So they became start addic addictive because they would they would have Twitter, they would have YouTube. Mm. They would generate a link called YouTube. They would generate a link called Twitter. And they would compare which one converts better. Of course. And then with different videos, they would say Bybit is better, or they would say how to trade on Bybit and to see which video converts better. Mm. So eventually everyone, we were the first exchange to gain all of the affiliates and uh, YouTubers. Um, and, and that actually gained us huge momentum. Uh, and that's how we kind of uh, start building our business. Yeah. So you provided basically data analytics, clear data analytics to, to influencers. Yeah. About... To anyone who wants to promote Bybit. Mm. We give them full transparency. We give them a, a whole CRM to analyze. We give them um, and, and, you know uh, all sorts of tools and whistles. Now with the Bybit... Uh, Affiliate backend, we can do auto campaign generations. We can do uh, many, many things. So if the uh, our partners wants to start a competition, it's one click. They can start a competition with their, their own community. Uh, so many things they can help to to convert and all that. Yeah. How quickly did this make a difference? Like in terms of numbers, if you have to say, "Ah, oh, look, we had that many customers," and then we started to do that and immediately. That it was months, the effect had... was immediately. Immediately, the first affiliates brought in 300 people, 500, 2,000 people, and people start trading. Yeah. And that's where the liquidity came, when mm. people start trading. Yeah. And then March 2020 happened, which was this COVID crash where everybody got liquidated. And some players, we talked about that with Arthur, actually, they got really screwed because they lost a lot of clients because of that. Yeah. You managed to capitalize on that, um, get some market shares. March 2020. Um, we managed to gain market share throughout until 2020 as well. Um, I think it was not because due to how successful Bybit was. It was actually, it's because BitMax was getting a lot of legal attention and all that. Uh, I think with that, uh, they couldn't focus so much on expanding and all that. And there was a lot of noise happening and people were looking for alternatives. Mm. Uh, before that, they weren't looking for alternatives. Uh, actually, before that, there wasn't any alternatives um, before BMAX time. Uh, there was no alternatives. And everyone was talking about, you know, the the the, the, the huge spike, that whatever it's called, the BART uh, spike, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the famous liquidation engine of VMAX, everyone made meme about it. But in a way, that was benefiting competitors because um, uh, we just kind of put our heads down and, and be the alternative, right? FTX was the same strategy. Mm. FTX was the alternative. Uh, when VMAX started to uh, uh, fall because all these illegal issues, I think the ultimate was, was Arthur had to leave and that leads to, you know, a lot of people leaving BitMax because they don't believe the platform because the guy left, right? Mm. And that kind of uh, caused uh, 
the shrinking of the market share. I think now it's it's very small. Um, but um, I, I I wouldn't say it's one thing. It was a combination of things that gradually happened. Uh, I remember one of the biggest thing happened was also, I think Bitmax have to be more compliance. Uh, they uh, they 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 start doing KYC, whereas none of the competitors did KYC, and that what that people really hated it. Mm. So I, I don't think it was actually the spike or any of these things people made fun of caused the problem. It was actually a lot of these compliance things where the industry was not ready for compliance. Not like today. Today, everyone's ready to do KYC. Back then, nobody wants to do KYC, right? And if you're the first one to do KYC, you're fucked. Uh, and they had to leave a few markets, and that kind of gave away a lot of clients. So, you know, that happened, yeah. How, how big is Binance? Uh, how big is Bi Bybit today? So Binance is about 50% of the market share. Bybit is around 15 to 18%. Uh, yeah. What does that represent in terms of volume? We are, um, recently has been better, about 10 billion uh, a day, daily trading volume. But the first half of the year was bad, this this year. It's, it's, it, was, it was a beer market, right? Mm. Uh, it was about 5 billion, I think. Yeah. You moved to Singapore two years ago? Three years ago. Why? Uh, because Singapore is very embracive of crypto, yeah? And, and it was one of the leading um, regulator country to embrace crypto. Uh, of course, you want to do your business and set up your business where the the authority and, 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 the, and the government embraces the technology rather than seeing it as a scam, right? Uh, we started off in China, but China until today is very unclear. Mm. Uh, and this is why we never touched the China market. There's a few markets that we never touched. This is China, US, and Singapore. Uh, Singapore is because we're here. And, and the local is, and the regulator embraces t blockchain. Uh, and we moved here and we applied the license. Until today, we still haven't got the license. So before we, I, we get the license, I said, we're not going to do any business in Singapore. So we have no business in Singapore. So how is it possible that Singapore embraces blockchain, but doesn't give licenses to businesses that operate in Singapore? Uh, we, we don't operate in Singapore, but we operate out of Singapore. So anywhere else in the world, we can operate except China, US, and a few jurisdictions we don't operate. Um, but yeah, I mean, to the, to, the, to the Singapore government, we're just a fintech company that provide uh, fintech uh, support and all that uh, to our global entity. Yeah. Do you th so after moving here, do you think that Singapore is as advanced and as open to this crypto innovation as they market themselves? And by that, I'm just thinking about back then I was living in Geneva that was in 2019 saying, ah, oh, we em embrace blockchain and crypto, right? There was the Malta thing. There was a, a bunch of countries and cities that were kind of like marketing themselves to attract talents. But actually the truth was it was extremely difficult just to even open a bank account linked to your crypto business. So the actual marketing was much more than the actual truth of the, um, how well it was accepted there. What do you think about Singapore on that side? Compared to your expectations when coming here. No, things have definitely changed. When we came, we were very excited about Singapore. We think uh, it's all going to be open. But until FTX happened, mm. well, Singapore is over embraceive on FTX. Um, when FTX happened, uh, Binance exited Singapore. Uh, Bybit never operated. We were never here in Singapore. Mm. So for Singaporeans, their only choice was FTX. Mm. And because they were invested by Tomasek, they even had access to SimPass. So you can use your SimPass to log into FTX. Uh, and that's a huge uh, gateway opened uh, to exchange, mm. uh, if you can use that to log in. SimPass is like the ID that everyone has for the sake of the, the, the viewers. Um, that's why there were a lot of victims um, in Singapore uh, of FTX. So the whole perception and political uh, uh, stance on crypto has changed so dramatically uh, that Singapore, I think now, it's very conservative on crypto. 
uh, and, and probably this is why you see a lot of companies moving to Dubai. Uh, if you go to, I mean, I don't know, were you, were you here at the 2000, 2049 uh, token 2049? This year? This year? I was this year, last year, absolutely. Yeah. You were here last year too, you were here this year. Yeah. You noticed last year there were a lot of officials from MES, mm. EDB, they all came to speak and tell the industry their stance. This year you don't, single, you don't see a single soul that represents the government or official capacity in 2049. And that's how far away they want to stay away from the industry. They don't want to be seen publicly associated with crypto because the general public got hurt and everyone is criticizing crypto and everyone is criticizing Singapore on being too embraceive of crypto and had all these scammer happen, three arrows with Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, right? And a lot of things, you give Singapore a very bad face. And so they have to do something to be more conservative. So I, I completely understand. Um, and up until this day, we have we still haven't got a license, I, but I don't think our licensing has anything to do with that. It's the fact we actually did apply late. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were just moved here first and they were like, hey, we'll figure this out. And then we gradually applied, uh, but we were among maybe the second batch, but I think they are still processing it. But I think down the road, Singapore is gonna make it very clear. They're gonna see it as an opportunity, uh, as a technology. Uh, but not as trading. Yeah. So more on the business side and less on the retail side. Maybe, yeah, real world adoption, real world asset, you know, RTA, all that stuff, maybe will happen in Singapore. But on the trading side, on the exchange side, OTC side, payment side, I think it's going to be slow. Even with the latest crackdown on money laundering and all that, I think crypto was involved in Singapore, yeah. We talked before about um, your 19 years old son, if you are a below average person. You have two kids? I have two, yeah. And you told me you built your own school, non-profit. Yeah, in Singapore. Because you think that, because you want to make sure that they get the best education possible? Not necessarily they get it, because by the time I built it, uh, my bigger boy is already out. He went to uh, other schools. It's it just when we, when we first arrived in Singapore, I, my kids are young. Yeah? They are three and five. Um, so we were looking for preschools. And all of the preschools were very commercialized. You have like all these famous Eton, Odyssey. And you go, you feel like they are more, they're more serving the parents than the kids. I don't think I don't feel like they are having the kids as priority, mm. but the parents as priority, and they would always show off to the parents what the kids do, and I observed the kids fucking hate it probably. They would show oh today we did artwork we did this and the cap the parents were so happy. I wasn't happy because my kid never do that at home. Now if he came here and decided to do all this shit, you forcing him to do it, and, and I asked him are you happy here? He's not happy. He's he doesn't want to go to school. I said why? Because the fucking teacher forced him to do a bunch of shit. And, and and this is what I feel also when I do interview, not interview, like when I go to school to see, mm. uh, I just feel the overall vibe was more like a, a, a nanny school thing that- um, They're the saying UK. something to you and not for the, that's not aligned to your kids basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the kids start, can basically start to talk and you realize he's not enjoying the play because he's not really learning. And uh, I'll give you an example, like there was a, in the afternoon, they have to sleep for one hour, right? From 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, like for the preschool kids. But there's the kids that don't want to sleep. Now, they will force them to sleep and ask them to just lie there, open their eyes, and just do nothing. This is common practice in Singapore. This is common practice, yes. And if you ask your kid, then can you tell the teacher you don't want to sleep? She says, okay, you don't want to sleep? Go play by yourself. I'm like, why can't you assign a teacher to fucking te play with him or teach him something? And or there must be other kids who don't sleep. Let them form a little thing. Just kind of not be so, you know. Yeah. Um, but these are the things I find that piss me off completely. So I'm like, um, because I've been all of my school, uh, I went to work nonprofit. I just, I, I somehow just don't like this profiting school. Uh, 
profiting from education just doesn't go well with me. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah. So I think, okay, then if, and I, I did some research, there's no nonprofit preschool in Singapore. So I was like, fuck it, let's just build one. Uh, so we built one. Um, and, um, but after preschool in high school level, there's nonprofit schools in Singapore that are very good. So my my older boy I'm now going to uh, actual bigger uh, high school kind of not high school but big school that's nonprofit yeah. So how do you rethink this preschool, except for the naps that uh, they don't necessarily have to take? What's the few key things that are completely different that you want to do in your preschool? Oh yeah, so there was a few things I couldn't find. Number one is uh, it has to be a nonprofit. So profiting and basically putting the parents as your top clients is wrong. You should always put the kid as the top client. They are the clients. Um, and, and so that's number one. Number two is, is the school of thoughts, I guess. There's many different Montessori. There's many, yeah. So I, I believe in a play-based, intuition-based. So we picked Reggio Emilia, which is the Italian kind of a school of thoughts. It's the, the, the teachers there is you have one assumption is that the kids know what they want. You are there to discover what they want and help them to grow into what they want. But you don't mold them. The teacher's job is not to mold because they already have their own shape and own form. You help them to discover. So it's a very personalized approach yes, to education. to play and all that. So in that means it ha the teacher to student count has to be low. So in our school is about 10 to 15 kids per teacher, maximum, yeah? Uh, and also in the school, it has a lot of play-based areas. There's the sand area, there's the th cinema, there's art uh, artillery, there is the physical artillery, the water, because they discover through touch, through perceptions. So you, you cover all the perceptions and you, you, you observe as a teacher which perception triggers them and then you kind of mold. Uh, and you design the classes around that, right? Uh, so that's one. And also uh, the school is more intermingled with all ages of kids. Mm. You're not letting three-year-old only be with three-year-old. The school is one big school where you have maybe one big topic this semester. So the older kids and the younger kids, they all play together and they can learn also like a normal society. You don't just hang out with people at your age, right? Uh, lastly, it's, uh, it's Chinese immersion. Typically, all of these Western schools, they're not focusing on Chinese. But what I want my kids to fucking speak Chinese fluently like me. Mm. So it's impossible to find a school that has a good Chinese program plus the things I want, like nonprofit, because the Chinese schools are so strict. They will come with a stick and ask, force you to memorize Chinese shit. So we, we actually hired the best Chinese teachers out of China. Uh, and then so the, the Chinese program, the school is very strong. So it's a very unique school. It's a nonprofit. It's rich Amelia plus Chinese immersion. These three things are, are very unique altogether. Yeah. So that's what the school uh, is uh, is offering. Yeah. At what stage does the technology get integrated in the kid's life? Technology in, in, in terms the education. of... First, a smartphone. Yeah. Then... We're talking about AI and how basically it can help with personal, personalized education, right? So how do you plan to integrate? What, what's your thought on the smartphone integration for kids, especially in the context of school? And then kind of, I would say later on, but even at the same time, because AI is linked to your phone, how you integrate that? Because your goal, you said, Kids learn through touch and through trying different things, which so, has nothing to do with technology, right? Oh, no, it has everything to do with technology. Uh, our uh, playground is, uh, is a big iPad. Uh, they can touch, they can play. And also it's the projector that automatically feel and there's little things they touch and the bubble burst. It's interactive. Mm. So it's, it's very technology uh, uh, intensive. Uh, first of all, I think we have to embrace the fact that iPhone uh, phones pad is going to be part of life. So I think you want to expose that to the kids as early as possible. You want you don't want to be hiding it, uh, make it look like it's such a tragedy, and then you, your kids eventually find out it's so addictive. And that's how they became addictive, I think. So if it's part of life, they should be exposed. So our school has all of it. 
uh, and they can um, by the design program they can play with it. So the KC is part of their learning process, and uh, there's also stories being read through iPad sometimes. Um, I mean, so there's no. I I don't think we are trying. Uh, purposely avoid technology, but wherever it's appropriate to uh, adopt, we will adopt. Um, but the main goal is not, uh, it's only a mean to the end. The end is still helping the kids to discover what they want to do and things like that, yeah. What do you, I mean, you kind of mentioned it before, like you have a problem with the fact that education and profit, they can't match, I think the exact same. Same with health, actually. I don't understand how health and profit, uh, uh, can be linked together because it doesn't make sense to make a profit from people's health. But let's kind of dig more into this. What do you think about the whole for-profit school system? Because it's huge. It's a huge business. All these Ivy League schools you talked about before that make, you know, parents so proud. All these big schools in Europe, it's basically, I mean, some, some call themselves not for-profit, but actually make a lot of money and they have these endowment funds. So it's kind of not really true. Should good education be for profit? And why? Yeah, so when we say profit or non-profit, it doesn't mean the business doesn't generate profit. All of the business should gener pro generate profit. Even the school where I run, they generate profit. Because it, is, it, it actually it means that you provide a valuable service and goods, you know, and people like to pay for it. But the difference is nonprofit is when the profit you made is always being redistributed back to the school to build better facilities, to train the teachers, send them to Italy to learn the Reggio Emilia, for example, right? And, and give them better trainings or update the equipments of the school and all that. Um, so I think a lot of these, like I believe school probably are nonprofit in a way that, but I think there needs to be... Um, a, a transparency on how they're spending their money. Uh, so at our school, um, well, so so still now it's about sixty kids. Uh, the school is called Lily Valley. Uh, about sixty kids now at Lily Valley. We're still making a loss. <laughs> so, but the moment we're turning profit, I'm gonna release all the financial books and everything. So pe the parents can see uh, how the money is in, in, being spent. And my goal, ultimate goal, is to run a DAO. <laughs> so I get a token to all the enrolled parents, and they can vote uh, on the decisions where the money and where the profit should be going. So eventually, I want to run a school like a DAO. But uh, currently, because it's still loss-making, and, and, and I'm, I'm reimbursing on the, on the monthly, whatever. Uh, but the vision will carry. I think by end of uh, next year, it will be profit-making, and that will start to happen. We'll have a little DAO. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> who are the families who put their kids in your school? Um, How do you attract them? Uh, so it's it's actually when you were in a preschool, location is number one consideration. So the location of the school is at uh, 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 Marina Square in Singapore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you see parents mostly are people who work it, uh, near that area or they stay at the area. And and literally most kids are about three, maximum three to five kilometer range of the school. Because when they come to preschool, people are more easy towards, uh, they want location first. So that's number one consideration. Uh, number two is we do have a lot of the staff kids there. Uh, I give them a, a, like a half off uh, if it's by the staff to go to the school. And we do have a lot of staff that have kids mm. that wants to send there. So they send their kids there. Uh, and what we noticed is now the philosophy of the school is getting more understood by people. And there's people taking school bus and from coming from far away to come to Lily Valley because they also believe in the same philosophy and things like that. Yeah. What do you think about making profits in the health sector? Um, look, it's, it's, it's a complicated topic, yeah. For example, I do understand if you are in medical uh, and, and, and the money and the time required to research and build a, a medicine that would cure certain disease, let's say, 
uh, the, the capital investment is huge. So you need that pattern, uh, you need that price to be able to recuperate from the research and whatever, right? Uh, but I think when it comes to uh, really kind of death moment uh, and, and critical moments, you shouldn't be considering profit. You should save people life first. Uh, and I think that's what most government help uh, with certain fundings and everything. Uh, but again, um, I mean, it is definitely a, a very profitable industry. And um, to be very frank, I, I don't know how to fix that problem. Yeah. In your free time, you love to do water sports? Yes. You're part of a club here in Singapore? Not part of a club. Um, because Singapore, you can only do water sports. You cannot do water, I mean, snowboarding or all that. So I do wake surfing. I do foiling uh, in the weekends. And I, I do tennis. So I, I do a lot of out outdoor sports. What do you love so much about snowboarding? Um, snowboarding and, and wake surfing and foiling, all sorts of board sports. They all have one thing in common. In order to do good, you have to let go. Hmm. You have to go with the flow. It's very interesting. Invite one of your friends who is a control freak, they will never be able to do surfing because every part they want to control and everything will go against them. So the key to uh, be good at surfing, snowboarding, everything is not planned. It has to be spontaneous. It has to be you going with the flow and you have to relax and re enjoy the moment. And this is what I love because it's, it's a completely different than what I do at in the, in the office. In the office, I'm very particular. I'm very control kind of on the detail and I'm very, I have to be aggressive. I have to check, hold people accountable. I'm the one that I have to remember and, and be very, you know, um, not letting go. But I need something that, I can simply relax and let go. And so that's why these sports are extremely uh, appealing to me. Yeah. It's interesting because we had uh, Annabelle Huang yesterday from uh, Amber yeah. on this podcast. And she was saying exactly that. She was saying she loves extreme sports. Okay. And she loves skiing. Yeah. She loves bungee jumping. Yeah. Um, and it was the exact same reason. She said it just that place where you can't even think. Yeah. Because you have this thing happening to you and like you, it's the only thing, it's kind of like a meditation basically. Right. It's the yeah. only thing you can focus on and, and, uh, and it's definitely almost, she said, a way to escape. Yeah. Sometimes. So very similar. Why should everyone have a hobby that is linked to a physical activity? No, it doesn't. I love to play games. I'm actually, uh, I'm a gamer too. So, uh, yeah. What kind of games? I was playing Diablo 4 and, and, uh, for a while uh, until season one. Now it's season two. I, I stopped on the season two mm -hmm. because season one was a bit devastating. The, 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 all these malfunctions, all these bugs they had. Uh, but season two, it seems interesting. Maybe I'll get back. But there's one game I played for like more than 10 years. <laughs> this is very strange. A lot of people don't know this game. It's called World of Tanks. Uh, I don't know if you know. Oh. It's by Wargaming, this uh, Russian company. It's amazing. It's, it's tanks. Getting each other. And, and what's really good is it doesn't cost so much time. You go in and you join the battle and it's 10 versus 10. Like different mechanism. There's light tank, medium tank, heavy tank, artillery and all that shit. Uh, um, you choose your tank, you join a 20 people battle and there's different terrains, mountains, uh, they're hardcore tanks. They're like very sophisticated, not the, not the, the Sicily uh, games that people used to play, the black and white, whatever. So it's, it's very relaxing and it's, it doesn't, I don't play first shooter because I have motion sickness. So if I, I play like this Call of Duty, I get very sick, mm. but the tank is very slow. So it's, so this yeah, it's very fun. <laughs> so yeah, no. To answer your question, for sports, I like to do. Of course, you have to sweat. You have to do that. But I have, you know, I play games and all things. Doesn't have to always be physical, right? Yeah. The gaming thing is really interesting. 
because if I look at my most successful entrepreneur friends, yeah, or even people in crypto, they're all previous gamers. Yeah. And so one of the explanations is that these games, you know, there is parents who think, still think today that I don't want my kid to play all these, you know, computer games or video games because it's not good for them. But what I notice is a lot of people who are successful entrepreneurs or successful in crypto or both were gamers or are gamers. And one of the reasons is because they learn how to manage scarce resources and become more strategic. What do you think about that? I think there's one element I do agree, but it depends on the game and all that. I have kids. I, I, let, I let them play games. Why? Because what's more important to the kids is they actually find something they like to focus on. Uh, focus and try to solve the problem with focus is so crucial that you realize when you get in the world, most people cannot do that. They don't focus they, or they cannot focus, especially when they solve the problem. So if you, my kid, uh, not only they play game, like my bigger son loves Lego, right? Mm. When he gets Lego, he stopped eating. Like he skipped two meals. <laughs> the mom is very concerned. I'm like, dude, he's, he's, he's five. He, if he's hungry, he'll eat. But do not interrupt his focus. It's more important for him to enjoy the focus so that in life, he know whatever things he want to do, he will focus and devote everything into it. And I think gaming is like that. You fucking focus, you get a game you want, you, you, you straight up like two, three days, right? If you have that kind of focus, it's actually very crucial to build a company uh, uh, to do the same. I think that's what I see in games is more important. Uh, yeah. What's another good way that you found for people to improve their focus? What's something else? that you would love your kids or that you would let your kids do because you know it's good for their focus? Um, I think, I think that, that there's only a few things as a parent you can do. Uh, and uh, one of the most important is to discover what they like to focus in. I, I hardly ever force the kids to focus on things I believe is right or not. But when I see my kid don't focus, I think there's certain things he hasn't been exposed to that he will be focused in. Mm. So my job is to give them exposure. So let's try tennis, let's try soccer. And if he gets bored easily, I start to see which part of the things he get bored. And then I try to incubate the part he doesn't get bored. So again, my philosophy is also that I'm not trying to mold him. I'm trying to discover what he would be focusing and I'll, I'll, I'll give him that exposure. Yeah. It's super interesting because yeah. We had, uh, we had Magnus Grimland, the founder of Handler and Zalora on yeah. the podcast. And we talked about meaning of life. And then he was saying, the meaning is too complicated, but what you can find is your passion. Yeah. And the best way to find your passion is exactly what you're describing. And it's exactly what he's doing with his kids, yeah. which is you need to put them in front of so many different things yeah. that they can try where they find that they, they're passionate about or basically they're focused about because the focus will come with the passion. Exactly, yeah. And that's, he said, the best way to help yourself or even more to help your kids to find the drive and the passion in life. And that's how they get on to, to become really good at what they do because yeah. they just, because they just love what they're doing. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's not the traditional path for most kids today because the parents don't think that way. Right. No, it's, it's kind of sad to, to define life as one pass. That is go to school, graduate high school, go to college, get, find a job, and uh, get a family, providing the family, and then retire with the grandkids and die. Um, that's just kind of a very boring pass, pass. I mean, people might enjoy the process if that's what you choose. But um, there's many ways to do things, I think, especially now uh, that if you can offer your kids exposures. I, I would love, to be honest, I, I think the saddest thing uh, you find, 
you're talking to a lot of people around you, especially people who work in the company that they don't have the passion. They're just like, oh, I'm just here to to make a living and all that. Is is that then what do, is is something you're passionate about? What is something you want to chase? The most issue is that they don't know. If you have a person who tell you a clear answer, you know he's on the way there. He mm. will get there, because what he whatever he does now is just a, a path that he believe he needs some cash now to get there. But most, but ninety nine percent people they don't know. They're like, well, you know, I, I actually don't know what I want. So knowing what you want, and I would love my kids at high school tell me I want to drop out because I want to do this. Mm. Oh, I think I'm so jealous of that because I'm not like that. Even until uh, uh, a lot of times, I I, th I feel like I'm more responsible dri driven. I'm trying to be useful, but I, I I'm never a guy who had a clear, clear, clear thing I want in, since I was young. Even now, now I, I I think it's become more clear that I want to, like I said, drive the company. I, we want to provide the best product and service and things like that. But it wasn't something. Uh, after I graduate school, I, I, I planned, right? But that's how it's my style. I, I like to go with whatever comes. But if my kids, I'm always jealous of someone who says, hey, I want to become a fucking pilot or mm -hmm. become this and that. That's awesome. I think I think you sh if you are one of those guys, it's, you should pursue it, you know? Yeah. So what do you tell these people who say, you say, what's your passion? They say, I don't know. Then they just need to find it. <laughs> they are not exposed. The fact that they, they are not bugged about it is very the, the very issue. They should be bugged that they like, oh, fuck, I don't know what I want, you know? Yeah. I was talking to a friend the other day, and she was saying exactly that. She was like, I want to change my job. I don't like it. And I was like, so what's the plan? Or what are you, tr you going to try to do? I don't know. That's the biggest fear was, I don't know. I don't want to know what I want. And I was just telling her, you, you won't know what's your passion until you try really hard and you don't abandon. The moment you try something really hard, it's the same as starting a company. Yeah. If you start for the money purely, you're probably not going to make it because there's going to be shit moments and it's only the passion that's going to lead you, guide yeah. you through these shit moments. Yeah. So you, I told her, but that's just my idea, which, was, which is what I've done in the past, which is if I don't know what to do, I'm going to do three things at the same time. I have no life for six to 12 months. Disappear. And I know one or two of these things I'm going to be shit at, or he's not going to do that well, or I'm going to realize I'm not, I'm not driven by this thing. And therefore I'm actually bad at it. Right. But you knew it. So you, you try these three things because they kind of make sense. You have sort of like opportunities and then you naturally drop one of them or two of them. And you realize the one that you think that this podcast and the entire kind of events that we're doing around that is exactly that was, oh, there's this opportunity. We've done some podcasts online, kind of random with Dokun and a few other people like two years ago, but it was very bad quality and everything. And just thinking, I don't know why I have this gut feeling. I need to try this and one, two other things. And then you start and, and you realize, oh man, same as when you say the school, you don't make money in the beginning. You're like, oh, I, I don't care because I have a kind of plan and it makes sense. And for the podcast, the people were able to get on the conversation, we're able to have the feedback we have. And then we do some events just for the guests that are sort of masterminds that are so amazing. And then you realize, oh man, like even if you're not profitable directly, like it doesn't really matter because you have this, I mean, obviously provided you can survive in your life. Another way, you have this passion. And the most important is you will never know until you try probably a yeah. couple of months mm. that you really passionate because if you even think about quitting, it means that's not a passion. Yeah. What would you tell your 21 years old impatient self if you met him today? By Bitcoin? <laughs> You're expecting some profound answers, right? <laughs> yeah. This is a very profound answer because we can <laughs> we can go into the philosophy of Bitcoin and why it's amazing, which I think we both believe, right? So, <laughs> yeah. What's your biggest prediction for next twelve months? 
I, I'm 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 sure ETFs is coming, uh, and I'm sure that when that opens up, the whole gate retail will come in, and, and the market will pick up. I think twelve months probably is time. So, um, yeah, I think I think the outlook for the next twelve months is pretty positive. I think everyone's looking forward to it. What's your biggest yeah. prediction outside of crypto for the next twelve months? Something you've been thinking that might happen that most people might not agree with you. Outside of crypto. Hmm. Outside of crypto. I'm not sure which aspect. I don't know why. I, I, I just thought about they would discover gold on Mars. And then the Mars and the gold price would, would plumb. This and, is and crypto then, related. <laughs> and then this is... I was thinking, should I be shorting gold and, uh, and sell the gold? I, <laughs> I think you better buy more Bitcoin instead of shorting gold. You're yeah. probably going to be more profitable. Whether they find was this article gold. was this article about this or a, a, some dream I had? It was very strange. <laughs> I have the same thing. I don't know what's reality or not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I think it's been talked about for many years in crypto. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to discover some gold on Mars. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and uh, then everybody's going to realize that Bitcoin is the thing and Bitcoin is going to yeah. go to 1 million, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that, man. Yeah. Uh, that was awesome. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.